Welcome to the third session of the Gifts of Poets, a Sampler, sponsored by the Broome County Arts Council's Artisan Gallery in partnership with Wordplace at the Bundy Museum. This project will highlight several poets in the coming weeks in honor of April's National Poetry Month. My name is Connie Barnes, Manager of Artisan Gallery at the Broome County Arts Council, and with me is Jay Barrett Wolf, founder of Wordplace at the Bundy Museum. Brian Pregas from the Bundy Museum is also with us behind the scenes to record the sessions and produce the recordings. Our first poet tonight is Rindy Tass. Rindy Tass is a multimedia creative artist and world traveler slash adventurist. Her educational background includes an AAS in liberal arts from Delhi State University and a BA in theater acting and directing from Binghamton University. Although she revels in her wanderlust, she finally planted roots of her own and currently makes her home in Syracuse, New York. A native of Fishes Eddy, New York, and a citizen of the world, quote, I love the creative process and to be present and involved when a new work creation emerges, develops, and evolves. She continues to explore the essence of love light in this wonderful world of ours. Welcome, Rindy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My first poem is called um, Gemini Moon. Here it comes. In almost mid-December, on a cool evening, you quietly appear from out of nowhere. Suddenly, I look up and taking your willowy luminescence, sneakily peeking through the dark night clouds, a soft, mild glow like the light of a candle, not a prominent shine as the day's sun, but a low, subtle glow, peacefully, quietly, in only one part of the sky. The rest is dark and cloudy, you brighten just your immediate orbit. So when I want to see you, I have to look where you are. If my back were turned, I wouldn't know you were there. A smoky amber glow as if shrouded in a honey colored resin, a single light in the dusk, so unassuming, but absolutely present. No surrounding rainbow or precipitation just a soft, sexy smolder, soothing. All the heavens are in darkness except where you softly emit your night's illumination. The gray clouds part for a brief moment to reveal the warmly lit orb, David Bowie's serious moonlight. You don't shout or demand to be noticed. You just are. You got my attention by just being wonderfully beautiful. I couldn't ignore you if I tried. When I behold you, I inhale a breath of awe and pause and wonder. It embraces and reinforces my being. This marvel doesn't appear everywhere every day. So you must acknowledge it and express your gratitude. Yes, beauty does have a purpose if for nothing else than to fall easily on the eyes and to allow room for the realization that you are alive to bear a static witness. You snuck up on me and silently grinned in the twilight. Then with you on my left shoulder, we rode home. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a second one that is called uh, Pink Cloud Sunsets. I wrote this one, well, I was involved with the Binghamton Poetry Project, so this came out of uh, some of the writings that we did then. So, Pink Cloud Sunsets. Journey up the highway, taking in your presence, expressed in the remnant of a stormy overcast. I arrived just in time to bear witness to your unceasing beauty. I merge into you in all of your luminosity. The silhouette of the enormous earthly protrusion 
sculpts the glow. They meld into the dark figure. Taken aback, I had to pause and awe. So grand and majestic. No technological instrument could capture your grace and hold it at this moment's intensity. I can only hope to preserve a picture in my mind's eye the way I perceive you with my natural sight. A permanent record imbued in my synapses that I may revisit this magnificence and re-experience the majesty that is you. This only for a gracious moment. I can't have you forever. Oh, but that I am here for this instant. I count myself among the lucky. They just streak by, only catching a glimpse from the corner of their eye. But I want to see you entirely and revel in your boundless beauty. I don't want to miss any of it. While I am pressed for time, for this, it can all wait. The light falls on the earth differently in the autumn. Sun rays shine and reflect from other angles in a way that doesn't appear in any other season. You envelop my soul and hold it so close with a gentle caress. A sense of peaceful calm flows over me. I inhale your essence and celebrate your being with exhales of inspired laughter. I am renewed. Crimson laced with a royal shade of aubergine seeps into the cityscape. Layers of gold and azure, creamy orange moves into an almost lavender white and fades into blue and into you. And then there you are, lofting in the sky, lit from below by the descending star, so soft and billowy like cotton candy. Thank you. Um, the last one is a little different. It's uh, from a prompt that we did. Um, they often say that nobody writes poems that rhyme anymore, that it's not cool to write poems that rhyme, but I like rhyme, so I just called this rhyme play. It's just something I play with. Okay. A mix of black and red to the sight, like Merlot or Bordeaux, if that's how you say it right. Deep yet transparent when you hold it to the light. Intoxicating on my lips and sexy on my hips. Softly wrapped around my back, sipping, dripping down my neck. Sweet with a bitter end, like marlin berries or black cherries. Mine is a wine blend. Change the hue of my curls and coils, then spritz in a scented oil. Like hanging lighted ruby chandeliers, gently dangling from my ears, artfully applied to my full pout, smooths my glimmering smile when I go out. Ooh, what's that on the display shelf? Must try them on, can't help myself. Oh my, so fly, gleams like lacquer to the eye. Can't leave the store without these. Someone stop me, please. Parting with them, oh, too hard. My heart would shatter into a million contused colored shards. See if they will fit. A little tight at the top, loosen the lace a bit. Stand to the side, slide and glide. Tip my toe, make sure I'm ready for the show. Sexy, sultry, candy, sweet. A little retail therapy. Such a delight here on my feet. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a great crossing of nature and sensuousness in your words. You want to talk about that a little bit? Tell us what what draws you in those directions? Actually, often when I am writing, I am inspired 
much by nature, much by the, the sunsets and the clouds and things of that nature. And um, I just find well, exploring my sensuality and nature to me is very sensuous as well. So of course, things to to melt together. So and and I don't know. Sometimes I hear different artists who are you know when they're in angst or in pain, they find that inspiring, but I don't find a inspiration or a creative space in pain and hurt. But when I'm <laughs> in my happiest space in the sunlight, in the moonlight or in different, I just love to travel to see different natural occurrences. So that, that's what generally does tend to inspire me. Tell us a little bit about how you came to poetry as a means of expression. From your resume, you have a wide range of choices. <laughs> I suppose they do. But uh, well, I've, I've always been interested in the arts and theater, painting, multimedia. I've always loved the arts for as long as I can remember. Um, if I could have made a career of it, Full time, I would have done that. <laughs> yeah, that would be mm -hmm. a perfect thing for me. Uh, I've written poetry before, but more regularly now. A friend, my friend, um, actually Kaloa, one of the next poets, actually uh, encouraged me to start attending the um, Binghamton Poetry Project, and uh, so I've been staying with it more and just expressing myself more through this medium. But um, art in general it has always been you know, my forte. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Rindy. Thank you. Um, Thank you for me. <laughs> our next poet this evening is Joanne Corey. Uh, Joanne rediscovered her childhood love of writing poetry in her 50s. Her local poetry community includes the Binghamton Poetry Project, Broome County Arts Council, the Great Grapevine Group, and Sappho Circle. With the Boiler House Poets Collective, she has completed an almost annual tent residency week at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in North Adams since 2015. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Um, thank you, Barrett and BCAC and the Word Place for the opportunity to celebrate National Poetry Month especially with my, my fellow Bainerton Poetry Project participants. Um, I thought I would create a little poetry sampler of my own of some of the kinds of poems I typically write. I most often write three verse narrative poems. And this first poem is a centerpiece of a chapbook manuscript about my mother, um, particularly about her final illness. Lemon Pizzelles. One, pressing time. A batch takes only 30 minutes when we work as a team. While the griddle heats, my husband creams eggs and sugar as I melt a stick of butter. He measures a cup and three quarter flour into the sifter while I intersperse two teaspoons baking powder. By the time the press is hot, the stiff batter is ready for him to spoon slightly north of center on each of the pair of designs. He lowers and locks the lid. I press the timer set for 30 seconds. When it rains, I silence it as he unlocks the press, lifts the hot pizzelles onto the small cooling rack I hold and spoons the next batch. I move the cookies to a larger rack as they stiffen, stack when they are cool enough. Spoon, press, timer, rack, time divided into 30 second increments until the bowl is empty and the tin full of pizzelles to bring to my mother. She shares a few with my father. Two, marking time. A friend says the women in her Italian neighborhood used to time pizzelles by praying Hail Marys, but disagreed on how many it took. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
When we called in hospice, your appetite was failing. Your tastes were changing. You didn't want anything too sweet. Lemon pizzelles, a favorite we made at Christmas, were perfect. It was summer, but no reason now to wait. It depends how fast you pray and in which language. Latin would be faster, fewer words. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Or maybe they used Italian. Ave Maria, piena di grazia, il Signore è con te. You say you like them because they are light. We agree, smiling, knowing how much butter, how many eggs go into each batch. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You eat lemon pizzelles every day, sometimes several times a day. We make a new batch whenever you near the bottom of the tin. We try other treats, but you always want your pizzelles too. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. The pizzelles seem to help your appetite. We think you haven't lost any more weight. One of the things about hospice is that you don't have to do anything you don't want to. You don't want to weigh yourself. The bowl is almost empty. Only one spoonful left for the last press, one for dad. Now and at the hour of our death, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. It depends how fast you pray. That is also quite possibly the longest poem I've ever written. Um, when I do decide to write in a form other than free verse, I usually turn to Japanese-derived forms. My favorite is tanka, which in English is a five-line, 31-syllable poem. There are several tanka in the chapbook. This one is entitled At Night. In darkness, my heart pounds too fast against my ribs. Blood throbs loud in my ears, as though the umbilical had never been severed. Besides my checkbook, I'm also working on a collection of poetry that centers around the North Adams, Massachusetts area where I grew up. Um, and as Connie was saying, where I've returned to do residencies at the at Mass Mocha, the Museum of Contemporary Art there. Um, this manuscript that's under development has a lot of poetry of place about North Adams and the towns around it and the Berkshire landscape and also a number of ekphastic poems, which are poems that are inspired by another artwork. This next poem is both a poem, poem of place about North Adams and its industrial history and an ekphastic poem based on Phoenix Project, which is a very large sculpture installation by the Chinese artist Xu Bing. It was on exhibit at Mass Mocha the very first time I went there in 2013. Um, and Mass Mocha itself is on a complex of old factory buildings. Temporary residence. A phoenix follows her mate above the old factory floor, sunlight from the high windows glinting off metallic feathers. Risen from the remains of construction workers' lives and deaths, shovel blades, hard hats, gears, cement mixer, jackhammer chisels, metal twisted into submission. She peers at the shoe factory where her countrymen broke a strike, worked for three years at 90 cents a day and a warm bunk at night, then fled to Boston to found its mostly male Chinatown. At their appointed time, the phoenixes fly 
not east, but south, cast spectral shadows on the stone columns of St. John the Divine. And I'd, I'd like to close with a poem that I wrote in response to a Bantam Poetry Project prompt from our sessions last fall. And that was published in our first ever online anthology. Our prior anthologies um, with Bantam Poetry Project have always been on paper. Like many poets, I write in part to respond to what's happening. And this poem responds to both a personal um, and a global issue. For Jillian Grace. On my screen, you appear smaller than your 2.9 kilos. Kilos because from the start, you are a British baby. Unlike your older sister, born in the same upstate New York hospital as your mother, just miles from where I, bleary-eyed at dawn, stare at your first photos. Your dark hair peaks from under the knit cap meant to keep you warm as you adjust to air, not the tiny ocean that had been your home for 37 weeks. Your cheeks rosy against the white blankets in Winnie the Pooh sleeper. I long to cradle you to breathe your newborn scent, stroke your soft skin, feel your fingers wrap one of mine, hum quiet lullabies, claim you as my granddaughter, but you are 3,500 miles and a pandemic away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, it's interesting, your work, it's almost as if poetry of place expands to cover a very large part of what you write. Like, you know, writing about your new grandchild is also about place, mm -hmm. you know, and it's in there directly, but it, it seems that place has strong meaning for you across the board. You know, this yes. rootedness seems to be something you are either seeking or enjoying. <laughs> I think that that's true. Um, because I grew up in the Western Mass, Southern Vermont area, even though I haven't lived there since 1982. Um, I'm still very connected to that landscape. One of the things that has been lucky, I think, in my life is that I've been able to stay in one area and really get to know it and feel at home. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That does underlie a lot of of what I do is that sense of of being in a in a particular place in a particular time in particular circumstances. Yeah, there seems to be a sense of longing that revolves around your your viewing of place. Um, you know, a setting oneself indeed in that search for home. You know, the new homes we make as we move, as we become part of different places. Yeah. Um, in fact, the I've been playing with, what am I going to call the collection <laughs> that I'm working on? And one of my, my tentative titles for it is, is Homescapes. And that's becoming sort of an organizing principle of, of that collection um, mm -hmm. because there are things that are literally about the homes of myself and my family, um, but also about what it feels like to, to be away from home, to be separated from, mm -hmm. from home. Sure. And, um, and we'll, we'll see in the coming <laughs> months how that works out. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Joanne. We thank you, Joanne. It. Thank you. That was that was wonderful reading. Uh, our next uh, poet is Koloa. Uh, Z. A. Koloa is a native New Yorker who comes to the Broome County area often to visit her brother. 
Kaloa has been writing and performing her work for over 20 years. She writes in many genres, but as a poet first. Kaloa is also a spoken word artist, painter, photographer, designer, and freelance reporter. Her mantra is, being creative to me is like breathing. Without it, there would be no air. Welcome, Kaloa. Hi, how are you? Great, good to see you. So I'm going to read a poem called Create or Regurgitate. If I write poetry, I must follow style, form, and rhyme. ABA, ABA, ABA. Read Emily Dickinson, analyze a sonnet, and learn to write a villanelle. I want to create a road leading to a city using the power of a volcano, the fire from the sun, the gold on Mount Zion, and a vision that reflects endless legacies. Before writing music, I must first learn the piece before me. For Mozart and Beethoven wrote the perfect opera. I want to write poetry that makes people stand up on their feet and dance their way into a new eternity. If I study art or psychology, my method must first follow the conditions set forth by Pavlov and Freud, and my brush must bend to the will of Van Gogh. I want to recite language that animals speak and create peaceful giants that don't bleed. If I object, I'm considered to be defiant, to authority. Yet what happens to my voice when I'm forced to follow the same road dead innovators paved throughout history? I want to study a river as the grass cries, color your canvas with me as nature commands, listen, my breath is one with your heartbeat. Inhibitors try to stifle pure energy, putting one in a box and tampering with natural ability. I want the words I have inside to create a revolution, a revolution of enlightenment, empowerment, evolution and change. So why won't you believe that Langston Hughes visited me and gave me these words I speak, that I am Kunta Kinte and I will no longer let you beat me until I call myself Toby. That Shakespeare, Shakespeare, for whosoever, wherefore art thou, thou whoever cho chooses to think differently. That I am Sojourner Truth, I created the Underground Railroad and set the slaves free. That here I am once more, this time I come to set your mind free. That Christ, <laughs> I won't touch that one. You might not like my perception on that particular theme. Yet the teacher says to me, that is impossible and cannot be. Nothing new can be created from the arts. You're not a master. Everything is recycled energy. So how can you compare yourself to the great beings that once lived and breathed? How can I compare myself to those great beings that once lived and breathed? There are no written laws that say a new voice can't be seen. Believe me, I respect those great avatars that came through humanity. However, know this for a fact. Learning was never meant to be about just regurgitating what has already been produced throughout history. I am my predecessors, and my predecessors are me. They gave me a voice to speak. Like them, I choose to think free and I will no longer stifle my creativity. This one's a little different. It's, uh, I'm hoping I don't get emotional. I'm going to read it. And I'm not even sure if I should. My mother died last year and still trying to come to grips with all of that. And I wrote a haiku about it. And originally when I went to read it, as I got to the end, I got emotional. And sometimes you think you've gotten past stuff, but you realize you still haven't. And I chose a haiku because of, there's a lot saying honoring Asian people 
and that the idea that and thought that we are really two should treat each other as equals. And having experienced racism in my own life, I know how it is. So I chose a haiku. It's called Praise for Mother. Two dead girls, preemie babies, mother cries, twin tears, dark able showers, cold hospital walls, delivers eccentric girl, February storm. Three years later, January snow brings boy, little brother to love. Single parent cries alone. Who will wipe her eyes? A brutal winter. Rain, wet shoes, cold feet, newspaper to cover holes. The children need new boots. Pride wears mommy's kiss. Brown faces flash the summer sun, each cheek, dimple joy. Sparrow chirps, come play. What do we do with our peas? Mom says we must eat. Peas, our dog won't touch them. We've got to get rid of them. Can't leave the table. While mom sweeps under the radiator, the June sun peeps yellow balls. Two drops of concern, teen sleep, home alone. Operation takes mom's sight. Strong wind chases debris. Mom chases potential dates. They all tread in fear. Lightning storm warns, mother's wrath is coming. Teen's curfew must not be missed. Midnight, we're not home. Mom breathes fear like lion breathes air. We rush back scared. Thunder mimics mother's rage. Scattered leaves mimics teen's agita, run. Single mom rears two. God sends a kiss in the sky. The sunbeams of pride. Graduation, fledglings are leaving. Mother, so fearful to let go. Ugly honesty makes me villain. Mother's in hospital, hospital again. Death, conditioned fear. I miss her visible bliss. Wind, let go, let go. The son embraced mother today, welcome home, yet I still sit weeping. Child, she's all right, mama. Child, is she all right, mama? Chrysalis, yes, mama, she's all right. I'm sorry, I really didn't mean to get emotional, but I just needed to read that anyway. At this point in time, I'm not gonna read anymore, so. <clears throat> Thank you, that's really giving everything you can as a poet to share with us. Seriously, I appreciate your willingness to do that. I lost my mother in April to COVID. Um, so I really respect that piece a lot. Um, I really didn't mean to get emotional. But <laughs> it's tough. It's really tough when, uh, you know, you, you see so many people around you. And for whatever reason, it's a part of life, but it's really a tough experience. It's really, I think it's one, one of the toughest experiences that I've had to deal with. So it was and a it's... poem that I had started when my mother started getting sick, but I kind of like accumulated it when she ended up passing. But every time I read it, I try. I've always been an emotional person when it comes to writing and performing. And there are certain poems that I get emotional in, uh, in public. <laughs> but I don't mean to, but I do. But at any rate, we thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we'll we'll end the evening tonight. I wanted to thank you all for your wonderful readings and for sharing your gifts of poetry. Uh, next week, we'll hear from poets Jessica Dubay.
Bert Myers, Jerry Merskin, and Mr. J. Barrett Wolf. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was wonderful. You are much appreciated. We appreciate you giving us your time and your words. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.